eight fifteen. That is because fun fact is that today I am dialing in and calling you all from Amsterdam in the Netherlands. So it's actually quite late over here. It's eight fifteen p.m. Uh, so this will be one of my last uh, activities before the weekend. So if you see that it's either well, I've got this nice background, so you can't see how dark it is behind me. Um, but uh, I've had a lot of coffees today to stay up and get ready for this session. So I'm going to keep the the energy high and keep you guys engaged as we go throughout. Um, but so, yeah, I'm going to go ahead and kick it off now. Uh, I've also got my colleague Andy here with me. And so he is going to be helping answer any questions that you have in the chat or sharing some of the links and the different resources that we'll be talking about throughout the presentation. So please do feel free to jump in and ask your questions um, and, and chat. And uh, Andy will be able to, to help us manage all of that. And so as I go ahead and kick us off, what we're going to be talking about today is authentic assessment. And so specifically building a resilient digital ecosystem in a way that it can help you to support authentic assessment. And so a little bit about me, who I am, why I'm here, and Feedback Fruits, uh, the company that I work with. So my name is Cole Groom, and I am the partnerships team lead from Feedback Fruits. And so if you haven't heard of Feedback Fruits before, um, we are an educational technology company based here out of the Netherlands. Um, and so we've got 100 plus, actually around 200 partners now around the globe. And what our mission is, is to help hire education institutions unlock the power of pedagogy. Um, and so me, myself, I was, uh, during my bachelor's, actually got involved in the ed tech world, working for my first ed tech company, um, and ended up doing my bachelor's and my master's thesis research in different domains of, of educational technology. And since then have been involved in this space with different companies. I used to work at Instructure and now most recently here at Feedback Fruits. And so the presentation today, it's not really going to be so much about feedback fruits. Um, we're going to be talking about authentic assessment ecosystems and digital tools in general. Um, we're going to be talking about how AI and you know, various digital platforms can help to create this authentic ecosystem. Uh, later on, we're going to have some practical use cases and some assignment examples from the partner institutions that uh, me and my team have worked with. So some of those will reference the different Feedback Fruits tools, but a lot of these examples and key takeaways that we're focusing on today are going to be quite generalizable or applicable across whatever tools that you have for yourself at your institution that's available to you as a faculty member or as an administrator. And then we've also got some key takeaways for you and even like a short one pager that we want to share with some links, some videos, some resources that you can all explore on your own time and have some key takeaways from today's session. And so a good place to start is just defining and talking a little bit about what is authentic assessment and why is it important. And so as a recap, authentic assessment is a way to assess and require students to engage in a task or a problem that's contextualized within the realistic environment, and then also be assessing them on their knowledge, skills, attitudes, these KSAs required that they are going to be using as they enter into the workforce um, and become hopefully lifelong learners. And so this was something that for me, unfortunately, was really missing during a lot of my higher education experience. Uh, so often I was assessed almost solely on multiple choice exams. You had a multiple choice midterm and you had a multiple choice final. And those were your two assessments for the courses. And so this was a little bit disappointing for me going uh, here. I studied at the University of Amsterdam, which was, you know, a high ranked uh, institution here in Europe. And yeah, my, I would say my expectations in general weren't met and it didn't keep me very engaged in my courses because, well, I didn't see why it was important. I didn't see how it was applicable or what I was learning in these courses, how I was going to take that away into my future career. And so that's why we are such big proponents of authentic assessment. And myself personally, I've spoken at quite a few events over the last year about this topic um, because I do believe incorporating this into a course design and the way that students are assessed can really change 
how they look at their experience in higher education. And so when we think about why is this important, aside from my personal experience, uh, what the research says, there's a couple different areas of why this is beneficial. And so authentic assessment is a way to nurture these real world lifelong skills, but also to integrate these different teaching and assessment practices that optimize the outcomes, but also creating personalized paths for students to demonstrate their learning. So again, rather focusing on multiple choice, giving students a way to demonstrate their skills and understanding in a particular field of study. But it also allows you as a faculty member or an assessor to be able to capture the different stages of a student's learning. It's not just oh, you got 70% or 75% on this assessment, but that you can see kind of where that student is in their true understanding of these different concepts. But as you look at shifting towards a more authentic assessment strategy, it comes with some challenges as well. And so some of these challenges might be the way that you're going to be grading students. Um, it needs to be more detailed. It needs to be more granular. And it especially needs to be growth oriented, giving students that type of assessment and feedback that's going to allow them to continue their progression throughout your course. Um, as you look at authentic assessments, some of the different examples that we're going to look at is being able to facilitate that peer, but also instructor feedback, especially if you have really large course sizes. If some of you are teaching classes of 100, especially once you get to 200, 300, I've spoken to faculty teaching classes of 500 plus students. And yeah, giving good quality personalized feedback to all of them is quite a task. And so looking at some ways that we can try to streamline that, automate that, or get that peer feedback involved. Then as we look to do um, authentic assessments that are based around group work, because uh, what I always like to say is when we're speaking with engineering faculty as well, you're not going to build a robot alone. Um, and there's very few, few careers you're going to move on to where you're going to be working fully by yourself. So teaching students to work in groups, group work can be a really great way to do that but ensuring accountability um, that it's easy to manage for faculty and also student satisfaction in that process can be difficult. So we'll look at some ways that that can be solved, but also um, getting those oversight of the student progress and group dynamics in a group project or just their progress in overall different assignments um, can be difficult, especially with the LMS. So we're gonna talk about that a little bit more as well. But as we talk about building an authentic assessment ecosystem, I found this really cool paper from Beerman uh, and their team that was published recently. And so they break down these kind of three different areas of what does it mean to build an authentic assessment ecosystem. And so the first area to look at and focus on is gonna be the digital tools that you have. What are the ways that you're going to be delivering your assessments to these students? And so whether if that's the LMS, whether if that's third-party tools that you use, um, you wanna be able to build those assessments in a way that they can also be facilitated um, by some of these different technology tools and solutions that you have. And a part of the benefit of incorporating these different digital tools is that it helps to build the digital literacy of students, which are gonna be working with technology for the rest of their lives. And so kind of what they talk about here is that it's important first to address those competencies and talk about digital literacy in your courses. And then as they go on through using some of these different tools that you might apply throughout your course, that they will build those digital literacies um, throughout that experience. And then there's also the human capabilities. Um, and so helping students not to resist some of this technological change, but helping them to recognize the value and the capabilities that technology does have um, building these 21st century skills to navigate kind of this ever-changing ecosystem of technology, be it AI or really just kind of technology in general. And so what this will bring us to is as you are able to establish this quality digital ecosystem, it can in a way facilitate this more holistic scoring and assessment strategies, um, supporting a diverse array of pedagogical approaches, which we're going to look at some of those different pedagogies to support authentic assessment a little bit later on, but then also having ways to track and for students to demonstrate their competency development and mastery. And so 
with all of that in mind, let's talk a little bit about AI. I'm not going to say this pun out loud, uh, but that's that's what people are thinking. And I've sat through some really good presentations, even just today and, and all throughout the last year. But ultimately, when it comes to thinking about AI, um, it really brings to the forefront the importance of authentic assessment, because now it it can't just only be written essay assignments for students to be completing anymore. We want to look for new ways to assess students. Um, that is not the main topic of what we're going to be talking about today when it comes to AI, though. Um, what I the angle we've I've, I've kind of taken with this presentation is I wanted to show some of the ways that we can actually leverage and use AI tools that are available to everybody to help through this process of developing and implementing this authentic assessment ecosystem. And so now what I want to bring us into is what are some of these components that we can look at and think about as developing this authentic assessments strategy. And so one of the first things to consider is about creating holistic scoring and assessment for students. And so a lot of that is going to be based on the rubrics that you're using. So having a really strong framework of rubrics, which are specifically focused on um, the skills, the abilities, and the knowledge which a student will need to perform the tasks which will make up these authentic assessments in your course. And so one of the AI tips that we have here, and I'm sure you've all probably heard this before, but using AI to help you create these skill-based rubrics. And I'm going to show you some of the prompts that we've worked on personally here at Feedback Fruits and the ways that you can use it to create a quality skill rubric. But as we think about skill rubrics, well, it's important to, to talk about, well, what are some of the other types of rubrics that, that are out there might already be in use. And so if we think first just about a holistic rubric type, um, this is going to be more about single ratings. Uh, it's going to be about um, more performance based. Um, so it's a bit easier for students to see the full picture and to understand, but not as well suited for providing detailed and actionable feedback. As we take one more step, we can be at these more analytical types of rubrics where there's going to be multiple ratings for different criteria. Um, it's going to provide more detailed information about the performance. And so it's going to give you more space to leave that quality feedback for students. But again, being a little bit more time consuming to create. But as we get to a developmental rubric, which is really what we're going to want to be focusing on as we try to deliver more authentic assessments to our students, is that not just that there's multiple ratings, we want it to focus more on the skills that the students are demonstrating through that assignment rather than just their work. And so it's going to be more specific to why are we doing this assignment? Not just how should you do this assignment, but what is the reason behind that? And what should you be focusing on as you go into this particular piece of work and how are you going to be assessed on it? So it gives that ability um, to focus more on the evidence of learning and competency mastery rather than just the, the quality of the work. And the other kind of drawback here might be um, that it could not be as effective without constructive alignment with your learning outcomes and different assessments throughout the course. And we're going to talk a little bit more about constructive alignment here in a second. And so as you're thinking about, well, it's going to take some work to build these rubrics. AI is a great tool that can help to create these quality developmental rubrics. And so a couple of things you can think about as you build your prompt into AI to build rubrics for you. There's a couple of things that you're going to want to include. Your role, your program, um, the language and the tone that you want to bring across. What's the aim? How do you want it to be structured? What's nice is that we'll see in a second that it will spit out these very um, similar to how you have it in the LMS, be it Canvas or other LMSs you might be using uh, in that format that you're looking for. So it'll already be pre-built. Um, and kind of what are the standard requirements and levels across that rubric that you're looking for. Um, so this is a prompt. This is a prompt that we played around with a lot internally and that we share. And so this is something that will be kind of in that one pager 
takeaway um, that we're going to share at the end of the presentation. So nice if you just want to be able to copy paste this, make it specific to you and give it a try and see what it comes up with and compare it to maybe some of the rubrics that you're using or rubrics that you might want to use in the future. Um, and so, yeah, this is something that we've tried out, which gave us some very good different rubric options. And here's an example of some of those options, which it was able to create for us. So giving a really good breakdown of the overall competency looking for that we're looking for, but also the knowledge, the skills, the abilities, and the behaviors that we would want to see from students towards developing that particular competency. And then um, the actual rubric itself, um, kind of based on these different levels, which we've defined for this particular criterion, and then giving us those descriptors of how we might evaluate students in those different areas. So just one example, I really encourage you all to go try it out and play around for yourself, but it's a nice way to um, streamline that process of shifting over to a more developmental rubric. Rubrics is just the start, though. That is going to be the base of how we're evaluating students. But then as we think about designing the assessment around that rubric, um, this is where we uh, a lot of options really come into play across whatever discipline you're in and what type of pedagogies and different types of assessment that you want to incorporate. And so what I want to go into now is some of these different examples and options of these pedagogical approaches that can be leveraged towards more authentic types of assessment. And so we want to be using these uh, assignments uh, in a way that the student is required to demonstrate knowledge in multiple ways that's going to be relevant to the skills, but also to real life situations. And so I'll come back to this AI tip in a bit once we dive in a bit more, but I'm going to start just by going back into constructive alignment. So something that um, of you're probably very, very familiar with, but I wanted to talk about it a little bit here because it becomes um, really key as we think about authentic assessment by connecting what are the learning objectives and then what are the learning activities and the assessment moments that I'm going to build into my course to help connect and develop those learning objectives. And as you do this, it's really important that all of these are aligned um, and so that it will be more focused for the student, but also um, that they are continuing developing in these same areas throughout the course, every activity that they do, every assessment that they're participating in, where at the end, they're going to have this really clear track of development towards those learning outcomes and competencies. Uh, and so as we think about this, um, the teaching and learning activities, they're going to have to engage in these intended learning outcomes, but also as we think about the assessment, they're going to be built up using these developmental rubrics, um, and then you as the assessor being able to uh, judge how well that students meet this criteria. And so comparing what would be maybe some traditional tasks and what could be a more authentic version of that task, just to get some examples out there and to, to think about it a little bit. Um, so if we were to think about a traditional type of assessment, it would be something more around selecting a response, whereas an authentic assessment could be something like performing a task, so getting the student involved in the creation or performance of something. And as I'm going through these examples on the next two slides, I would love for any of you to put your examples of authentic assessments that you might have seen in the past in the courses that you work with or the courses that you're teaching yourself, just to kind of show that they're these can be a really diverse range of different things. What I'm showing here is not, um, you know, the, the only options. These are just a couple that, that we brainstormed with our team as we were putting this together. And so, yeah, I would really love to hear from you some of those different types of assignments and uh, activities that, that y'all have done yourselves. Um, but moving away from more of these like recall, recognition, multiple choice exams, and getting students to create, to construct, and apply that knowledge that they've learned through your course materials or through different learning activities throughout the course um, and putting it more into a student-centered approach compared to simply a teacher-structured approach. Putting that, that um, ownership and the ability to create and be more flexible into the student of how they might want to approach that problem. Um, and that's going to build those critical thinking skills. That's going to build um, that application of their knowledge compared to just kind of going about it and, and answering different questions. Um, and through doing these more student-centered and application-based types of assessments, you're going to be able to 
identify and measure this more direct evidence of learning rather than the indirect evidence of learning, which would be more kind of in this recall and recognition category. And so taking this to some examples, which would be more specific to an area of study, like for business, an authentic task we could think about would be asking students to design a solution for an identified workplace problem, again, where they are the ones who need to come up with and create that solution, which can be a great way to do so. Or if you're a computer science faculty, um, this is asking students to build a website that has certain features or meets certain criteria. These are the things that they're going to be doing as they enter into the real world as a computer scientist, as a designer. Um, just an example of one of the things they might be doing. Uh, when it comes to English, uh, write a satirical essay examining a social phenomenon. So again, putting it into the student of, hey, well, you choose the phenomenon that you want to choose, but then also write the essay in a particular way that they need to apply their own personal touch and taste to it a little bit more um, and more kind of in a medical context on anatomy, physiology, uh, write an incident report using anatomically correct terminology. These are just a couple of examples. Again, I'd love to hear from you about your examples. And so as we would think about brainstorming, well, where would I start? Where would I look um, for creating these authentic assignments in, in my class? So this is an example of, a, of another prompt, which we had worked on a little bit for brainstorming different assignments with constructive alignment that would be more authentic ways to assess students. Um, so again, including the role, including your, your space, authentic learning and assessment, having real world relevance and using the principle of constructive alignment. I want it to be aligned with this rubric. And then you can actually upload your rubric now and it'll analyze that and build you a couple of different examples of the assignments that you could use in your course. And so for an example, these was one of the um, different uh, examples that we pulled out of chat gpt uh, so where we wanted to build safety and quality and improvement this competency and then we got a learning activity and an assessment here so where the activity they're going to go through a workshop um, where they're actually analyzing real world safety incidents and looking at what was the problems um, and how would this have been avoided and then as they take this into their assessment they'll have to actually create their own proposal based on their root cause analysis of how these types of issues could have been avoided uh, in the future so again real world practical types of examples that we want to get the students thinking about and so these were a couple of the principles that we want to think about as we move towards authentic assessment. And what I wanted to bring now was a couple of these examples from the different partner institutions that we've been working at with Feedback Fruits over the last couple of years. And so one of the first ones I wanted to start with uh, was from actually Dr. John Fitzgibbons at Boston College. And so he's the Associate Director for Digital Learning, but also a faculty member. And so Dr. John Fitzgibbons was really at the forefront at, you know, now getting close to two years ago, embracing AI and using it in his courses. And so what he did is he used to have multiple choice quizzes and then realized that, well, this isn't going to work as well anymore. So he would take his quiz questions, put them into chat GPT, and then take screenshots of the responses and put them into discussion boards and ask the students to look at the response from chat GPT and analyze, well, what's good about this answer, what's not correct about this answer, and what is it missing? What did they not consider here? So focusing less on, do you know how to answer this question, but actually, do you understand everything about this question? And can you critically think and analyze about um, these answers and what the responses are coming from ChatGPT? Because, well, students are going to be using it now. You're going to be using it in your career. I use it. Um, I use it often. And so teaching students to not just use it blindly, but to think critically about how they use it, know what its strengths are, but know what its weaknesses are, are going to be a great way to build some of those real life skills um, and I'll, you know, get them to think more authentically. So this is more of a learning activity rather than an assessment, uh, but a great way to incorporate ChatGPT into some of those learning activities. And now, for the second use case that I want to talk about, this is a great one which came from Texas A&M University in their Health Science Center. And so what we were doing was um, taking 
uh, taking students through a social annotation activity, but specifically building this activity around this idea of thinking routines. And so I'm curious if this is something that y'all are familiar with. Andy, I would love if you would throw kind of this link here about thinking routines from Harvard into the chat just so people can go explore it on their own time. But essentially, thinking routines, um, and, and as I go back, uh, these are some of the different thinking routines. So possibilities and analogies, perspectives, controversies, and dilemmas with art or objects, synthesizing and exploring ideas. And so Based on your assignment, based on your course, you can pick one of these thinking routines that you think fits well with your assignment. And then from that, it's it provides this website that we shared from Project Zero and from Harvard. Uh, it has a set of questions and steps that can scaffold and support the student thinking as they go through a particular learning activity. So it adds this depth, it adds this additional layer um, to the way you might have a student look at a piece of content, which is already a part of your course, be it a research paper or a case study. Um, you can add these kind of pre-context of a thinking routine to have that as something that the student is thinking about as they go through this. And so through that, it's going to help reveal the student's thinking to the teacher, but also help the student themselves to, to name and notice themselves how they're thinking about a particular concept. Again, thinking about uh, going more towards these critical thinking skills. And so how we did this in this particular assignment from the Health Science Center, we focused on this connected, extended, and exchange thinking routine. And so before the students, as, as part of the instructions, went into this um, paper that they were reading, um, they were kind of prompted with these questions. So how are these ideas and information connected to what you already know? What new ideas did you get that broadened your thinking or extended it in different directions? And then what challenges or puzzles emerged for you. So it was a really great way to help students connect new ideas to what they already know, but also reflect on their changes in thinking. And so this type of application can work really well as you have students engage with different course materials, especially multimedia materials, but also to do so in an asynchronous setting or in small groups. And so they set this up here in what we call interactive document, but this would just be what you would know traditionally is social annotation. So whether you use feedback fruits, whether you use hypothesis, whether you use perusal or any of the different social annotation tools out there, um, students would go through a reading and then they would create their own discussion threads and have a um, small post as they were going through that reading within their group. And so then yeah, it was a really great way to structure um, and create more engagement because normally as we would think about course content, right? You just upload it into the LMS. And then students say, hey, go read it. But did they actually read it? How well did they engage with that document? Um, it's a very passive delivery method for content. And so through social annotation, it becomes a great way to turn that passive experience into an active learning experience and into a collaborative learning experience in a way with which you're building um, asynchronous asynchronous collaboration and engagement amongst your students. And if we've got a little bit of time at the end, I would love to show you guys, um, even in the LMS, kind of what that social annotation workflow looks like. Andy, I'm curious, I don't remember, do I have 45 minutes or do I have an hour? So then based on that, I'll, I'll figure out um, <laughs> how much I have. And so going on to the next uh, use case, this is another one that we worked on with Texas A&M. And this is where we were trying to improve the quality of student deliverables before they went and turned them in for that final submission of the teacher. And so these were in some pretty large um, student cohorts. And so students were only getting feedback at the end of the course, but we wanted students to be able to get that iterative feedback throughout that course and improve the quality of their work. So what we did was we implemented peer reviews as a way to encourage that peer feedback, but also to develop these communication skills, but also self-management with feedback from multiple sources. And so one thing that is a little bit unique to feedback fruits when it comes to peer review is that we have this tool which is called automated feedback. And so this is where we use AI to actually give feedback to students based on some set criteria for 
your particular assignment. These are lower order skills like the use of grammar, the use of active versus passive voice, or how well um, did they do their citation formatting for the use of like either APA. There's about eight different types of citations that it can pick up on, or even does it have the correct sections and the correct word count. And so what this does is this allows the student to get this feedback from AI on these lower order skills, which very often take up a large majority of time for teachers to give feedback to students on, even though they are these things that we, we would hope and expect for them to be able to do on their own. And so this was a way that they got that feedback first, but then they also engaged with feedback from their peers. And so we set up some different rubric templates on the way that we were able to um, give feedback to the students. So about their content and structure, about their academic language, this was focused on using the AI, the automated feedback tool, their format, their tables and figures, actually all of these were part of what was getting feedback from the automated feedback tool. But then as students went into the peer review, this is something that was a formative opportunity. Students weren't being graded on this specifically based on the quality of their work or their performance. They were being graded just based on the fact that they were participating well in completing these assignments. And so what it did is that it made students much more familiar with the rubrics that they were going to be assessed on for their final assignment, which was the same assessment. They were able to practice with drafts, but then, as I mentioned before, they were able to receive feedback in a large cohort without the need of the teacher. And so the effects of this were, well, quite, um, as you would expect, beneficial. And so what you see on the left here, I think it will also be on your left, um, here is this is how students were rating each other during the peer review. Um, and so it shows that there was a lot kind of in this second category and just a few coming into this exemplary. And this is what we call the heat map. It's kind of a course aggregation visualization um, based on your rubric that we're able to generate through feedback for instance. So this was from the peer review activity. But then as we went to the final submission graded by the teacher, what you can see is that especially in this um, kind of presentation and in this information presented and this critical thinking areas, a lot of the class moved from this experienced to the exemplary category of ratings. And so the quality of their work from the peer review process to that final deliverable was improving. And so showing kind of the benefits that you can create by having students go through a peer review. Um, again, also for a peer review, the way that students are learning through this is by comparing themselves to others. They're seeing in, well, what is the quality of work of others and how that might compare to what they've done and then being able to then analyze that and take it and uh, materialize it into their own work. So as we think about best practices when it comes to delivering peer reviews, um, well, of course, first it goes back to the rubrics, like we started with at the beginning, trying to focus more on developmental rubrics when possible, but also making sure that they're clear and concise so that students are able to provide effective and actionable feedback to each other. Um, if you're able to using AI for low stakes assessments to decrease the learning curve and help develop that student autonomy is a really great way to do so. Um, maybe Andy, if you wanna throw a link to the, the automated feedback tool so people can check that out in the chat as well. Um, but also after they're done with the peer review activity, you wanna to try to encourage that reflection. So having students write a reflection, this was an incorporated step already in the workflow in Feedback Fruits, but you can do this just with your native LMS peer review tool as well, um, asking students to write that reflection what was the best piece of feedback that you received? What, how would you compare your work to your peers? Or what are some of those key takeaways that you want to improve before turning in that final deliverable? And so that was the peer review use case. And now I want to take you to another one, which I find very interesting, which is team-based learning. And so here we were bringing team-based learning into a fully online course. Um, so normally TBL uh, would need to be facilitated in an in-person environment. Uh, traditionally, it would use kind of these um, scratch cards that the students would go through. First, they take a quiz individually, it's called the IRAT, and then they will get into a small group and take it together, uh, that same quiz 
again to see how they work together as a group and then at the end you get to reveal your score and kind of see how you performed as an individual and how you performed together as a group and so that is kind of the core of the team-based learning pedagogy there's also a couple other steps which you see on my timeline here this is what we refer to as the learning journey and so it starts with first the students having some preparation, some material that they might review on a particular topic. Then they will do the IRAT, their individual quiz, and then come into a group and do a group quiz called the TRAT, team quiz. And then there might be some clarification session and very often an open discussion about the answers and results from those quizzes. But then students will be given a case um, or a piece of work, which they're gonna work on together in their teams. And so they'll work on that deliverable in their teams, and then they will hand it in for what's called the gallery walk, where you'll actually go and see the different assignments from all the teams and discuss what you came up with, why and how. And then after that, there will be um, kind of a discussion about these different application exercises. And then at the end, the peers can actually evaluate each other on how they worked together in that team. So this is the full team-based learning pedagogy, where it's just the IRAT and TRAT um, is also a portion of it, which can be applied if you want to have a little bit of a shorter workflow. And so at Feedback Fruits, what we've done is we've digitized this this scratch card process and brought it into the LMS so that team-based learning could be facilitated in a fully online environment. And so here, why would you want to go through team-based learning in your course? Uh, because it's a great way to build cooperation and problem-solving skills in your students while also facilitating deeper discussions, because you're bringing that discussion into a problem-based context. They're answering questions. They're working on a case application exercise together. And it's a great way to model real-world authentic activities and problems. Because like I mentioned at the start, you're not going to be building something like a robot by yourself or a piece of software. You're not going to be working in a business or a corporation by yourself. You're always going to be in a team for the most part and working with other people. So we want to create those authentic in real-world types of scenarios in the coursework as students are developing these skills. And so as part of working in a team, it's also going to expose them to and increase their understanding of diverse perspectives, which is one of the great benefits of creating diverse teams and just working together in teams in general. And so this particular use case that we're diving into here was actually implemented in what's called the interprofessional education program. And so this is where they bring different professionals across the health studies school. Um, so some people from dentistry, some people from public health, people from medicine and pharmacy. And so they will all, they take classes together across their different um, degree programs and work towards um, kind of general health cases, because this is how health professionals have to work together as they go out into, into the real world. And so that's why this TBL was such a great exercise to facilitate, but all of these courses were online. Um, so these courses, they had 400 students across these four different schools um, and faculty members, which were really just acting as facilitators rather than as the teacher. And so they were fully online and asynchronous. And then the students would set up their own Zoom sessions to go and participate throughout these different group assignments. And what we were then able to do was, and, and what you'll see just in general across applying a, a team-based learning pedagogy is once you go and compare, and it might be a little bit small here, but I think you can zoom in on Zoom now is that as you would compare the student scores on this IRAT, this individual quiz, compared to when they got together and answered them as a team, it's important to note that students don't see the correct answers after they answer it by themselves. Um, then they get together in the team and answer it. In every case, the student score was improving and, and kind of really well demonstrating what is the value of working together in a team. And so students get to really easily visualize that and see that through this process of working through a team-based learning exercise. Uh, and the thinking about facilitating team BL, TBL in the more traditional sense with scratch cards and in-person way, um, this digital format was able to save the teachers multiple hours of work. Um, as I've uh, 
talk to faculty members facilitating team BL in, in different schools across the US, they've mentioned that especially if you had a class like this with about 400 students, you'd be spending maybe three to four hours per session, per cohort, um, just setting up the scratch cards and then afterwards collecting back those scratch cards, averaging the scores, entering them back into the LMS, um, kind of by facilitating it in this digital format through Feedback Fruits, everything was integrated in the LMS and there was no manual work. Everything was pretty much auto graded and done and those grades submitted back to the, uh, to the grade book. But ultimately, what the faculty noticed by using this team-based learning pedagogy is that students were much more engaged with these assignments and much more engaged throughout the community. And we've got a lot of feedback from the students at what, as well that it allowed them to make friends across the different disciplines in, in the health science school, which they wouldn't have made otherwise, especially in an online course. So it's a great way to facilitate that community and interworking of people in an online environment. And then at the end of this, like I mentioned, they give feedback to each other. So again, I'm showing you how, how it worked in this particular instance using Feedback Fruits. We have a tool um, which is built into this team-based learning workflow learning journey, which is called group evaluation. Students go and they have a small rubric on kind of how they work together in that team. They give a first a self-assessment of themselves, and then they rate and give written feedback to the peers that they worked with on that assignment. Um, so it was a great way to also encourage this idea of peer feedback within groups as well. And so ultimately, as we deliver these different types of learning activities, which are built on these developmental rubrics, and as they are um, helping students to develop these skills and competencies, well, it's great to be able to track how students are developing this competency and especially developing these competencies over time. And so however that you're able to do that and give students this way to, to see that and track that over time is going to be really beneficial for them to self-regulate and monitor their growth throughout their program and their university experience. And so a portfolio is a really great way to do this. Um, at Feedback Fruits, what we have is this platform, which is called competency-based assessment. And so this is where we are aggregating those student results and feedback that they've gotten across all the different learning activities, not just in an individual course, but across their entire program of courses, um, and is able to pick out based on how you define the, the hierarchy, these different competencies, which are related to your rubrics and your different assignments, and then kind of shows them how they develop these over time. And so an example of where this has been done already is somewhere very close to home with us is uh, the University of Leiden here in the Netherlands, which is a very STEM focused um, institution. And so what you can see here is kind of an example of this portfolio where here the student was focusing on collaboration and critical thinking. And they can see kind of across all their different assessments aggregated into one place kind of how they've developed uh, these different competencies. And well, in this case, Carl needs to work on his collaboration, um, but his critical thinking skills are here up in the sufficient level of, of competency. And so one of the example designs from the courses uh, used at the University of Leiden was where they had a, bl a blog writing course. And so students were encouraged to develop their, these, these desired skills, collaboration, critical thinking, writing skills, um, by working in a writing circle, drafting, getting feedback, improving, submitting, reflecting, drafting again, going through peer feedback, improving, submitting, reflecting again. And so this multiple cycles of drafting, feedback, and reflection were able to, throughout the just the eight-week course, show a really significant improvement in the writing skills of those students by employing um, these different types of peer feedbacks and iterative improvement processes, but also allowing the students to track kind of how they were aggregating and receiving those ratings and focus on those key areas as they went to improve. And then what they have is this portfolio, this key takeaway that they have at the end of their degree program, which they can attach to their CV. They can share digital access to um, companies that they might be applying to as a way for them not to focus on just, here's my degree, but no, these are the skills, these are the competencies that I developed throughout my university experience um, going through 
these different courses. And so what that brings me to is first a summary of, well, what are the key elements of an authentic digital ecosystem? And so by creating this digital ecosystem built around authentic assessment, it can allow you to establish consistent standards, competencies, and outcomes across the institution, while also trying to facilitate and delivering diverse pedagogical approaches, um, real skill-based and real-world application types of assignments, which ultimately are going to empower instructors and put them in the position to foster these real world skills and competencies throughout their course. And then for the student, having a more growth oriented dialogue between their peers, but also with their instructor. But I want to make this a little bit more practical. So then what are some of the, the takeaways and ways that you can try to implement um, these different steps to build more authentic types of assessment at your institution and how might AI reduce the workload in doing so. Um, so first is going to be having real world learning objectives and aligning your course activities to them. So thinking back to this, this focus on constructive alignment as you work through a course design, um, but also trying to reduce the manual work on repetitive tasks or tasks which can be time consuming, such as um, brainstorming what types of assignments that you're gonna work on, setting up a developmental rubric that aligns with your learning outcomes, or even something as simple as just writing really good instructions for your assignment. Um, that's a place where using AI and using the right kind of prompts can be a great way uh, to to reduce that workload. And then as well as having that constructive alignment, offering suggestions for activities and assessments, but also personalizing the learning experience and pinpointing and highlighting uh, points of improvement and then getting tailored suggestions in a timely manner and ultimately assisting in critical thinking and digital literacy of your students. But so we have this one pager that kind of summarizes um, some of these key takeaways, has some links that you can go and explore, such as this authentic assessment toolkit by John Mueller, um, and then also some of the references that we showed throughout this presentation, um, but also some different recordings. We've got this AI Resight Sources Hub, or if you want to dive more into these thinking routines, um, or even just getting some best tips and these example prompts that we were showing during the slides. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to grab this link right now, and then I'm going to throw it in the chat. But then if anybody would like this sent to them or they would like the slide sent to them, um, please feel free to go and just like throw your throw your email in the chat. Um, and we would be happy to send all of this your way. Let me see where how I can send this to everybody. Oh, everyone in meeting. There we go. And there's that link to the um, kind of one pager key takeaways. And I'm also, I know we finished up just a little bit early, so I'm happy to answer any questions that you might have um, or have a little bit more discussion about authentic assessment in your courses. Thank you all for joining. I really appreciate you spending the time. Um, I hope I was able to keep it up enough. It is now nine. 9, 8, 9 p.m. here in the Netherlands, so uh, getting close to my bedtime, but uh, yeah, still rocking away.